Let me give you a picture of single slit diffraction from the textbook. So with a single slit diffraction, this is kind of what you are going to see. You have some light that's going through a single slit. So this is the diffraction grading that you have seen last time. One of the rows is a single slit. And when I put this through one of the wide slits, then nothing happens. Well, it spreads a little bit. Uh, when it goes through the smaller and smaller of the slit, you start to notice more of the spreading of the light. Even from far away, you can see the spreading of the light, right? Now, if you are closer, what you would see is that there is a repeating pattern of bright and dark fringes. And here, this row, it's one slit. It's not double slit interference, it's just a single slit. And that's what this picture here is showing. This picture from your textbook is showing that you see that happening. When light goes through a single slit, um, you get a feature, this uh, destructive interference here, that you do only say is from a result of interference. So what's interfering with what if you have only a single slit? Like you have one slit, there's no other slit that it's interfering with. So how, where is this uh, destructive interference coming from? Uh, so you do want to pay more closer attention to the slit now, right? What's happening to the slit? So this is where I need to remind you of a Huygens principle. It was mentioned in chapter one, it was way back when, and we didn't do anything with it. That's why I need to remind you of it. So let me use this picture to remind you of it. If we have light that's shining in from plane wave coming in from side, this is how one, I might draw it. You could draw it with these wave fronts that are coming in, and as it goes through the slit, initially only this portion would get through, right? Now, if this is, um, if this is how you are visualizing this, then from this alone, you wouldn't really get why it should, uh, maybe you get in intuitively that it should spread out. Maybe you get that far, but even then, what's not clear is why would you get destructive interference somewhere? So let me go into the more details of Huygens' principle. What Huygens' principles, by the way, um, I'm not good with the names. Almost all the physicists' names I pronounce in this class will be wrong. When I say de Broglie, I'm pretty sure that's not the correct pronunciation of the French physicist's name. So anyway, so the Huygens' principle says, this is what it says. It says that when you have this wave front, it says that each one of the points on the wave front acts like a source of a point, source of wave. So I could uh, consider this single point here as a, uh, as a point source that's uh, causing waves, that's causing, I guess, waves that look like this. And I can consider this source as a source of wave that's causing waves that look like this. And I can do it for an infinite number of points. And to construct this wave front that you see here, what you, have to do, what you would have to do is you have to imagine what is the result of all these different contributions adding. So um, you kind of you know, draw the lines along the, that rise the top, that's what gives you this. From the plane wave, you also get a plane wave. Now, when you have a slit, so, it's a, so it was an infinite plane wave before, now it's not. So now there's a difference. When you have, for this point source at the very left end, when you consider that to be producing this wave front here, um, in this portion, there is no comparable point wave source here that's going to essentially give you a flat line again. So that this gives you a picture of how wave sort of bends around. Because, um, so, in the middle portion, you can still get a flat wave front, but at, towards the edge, it kind of bends. So that's qualitatively how it's spreading out. But um, let me show you how this is mathematically useful. Instead of treating this single slit as a single light source, we can imagine it as an infinite number of light sources. 
So instead of wondering where is the other light source that the interference is coming from, we can consider interference between two different locations of one slit. So that's what we are going to do. And the next step is a little bit of a mathematical trick that um, no one's going to guess intuitively. So let me give it to you. Um, so this is a way of explaining why we see this, why we see this uh, in interference minimum where we see it. So this is how you would uh, analyze it. If you, you know, look through the textbook, you will eventually see this. <laughs> So, so I have all these, I can draw infinite number of point sources, so I'm just going to draw a few of them. <laughs> so we are looking to see which one of these, um, so how should I put it? So for the light that's arriving there from each one of these sources, so there's, um, Light, uh, there's light arriving to that spot from each one of these point source locations. Would it be fair to say that all of them are destructively interfering with each other? At this location where, you know, the intensity is zero, like that's the result you would get uh, if they were all adding up to somehow zero, right? So the question is how are they adding up to zero? So the way we are going to do it, we are going to find the pairs that somehow cancel each other exactly. And once we then move those pairs through the whole slit, then that explains why it's destructively interfering here. So for this first diffraction minimum, the way you find the pair is this. You imagine breaking up this slit into two halves. This portion, upper half and the bottom half. And what I'm going to try to say is that um, this portion, light coming from this portion, will be destructively interfering from light with the light coming from this portion. Uh, I guess this drawing is too small. I can't really draw anymore. Let me, um, uh, let me now erase this board so that I can draw a bigger picture and show you the, show you the, um, the geometry for figuring out the phase differences. And we'll go through the same type of argument we did in the first five minutes of this class to see uh, what that angle should be. Mm. So this is the single slit. Of, I'm going to use a different letter from the textbook because this is the letter your lab manual uses, A. Um, hopefully that's not too confusing. And so we are imagining a screen that's very far away. So when I draw the light rays, I'm going to draw them parallel because I'm imagining a screen that's very, very far away. So let's say that I have this infinite number of sources. And I'm saying that for the, for the angle theta, angle theta of the path of the beam, that represents the first minimum that I can pair this source with this source here, halfway across the slit. I'm saying that I can, pa may I can pair these two together so that they destructively interfere. So we go through the same geometry argument as we did for the double slit. So they are parallel rays, drop down this perpendicular line so given this data here, that data is the same data here, right? So this path length difference, what is the smallest path length difference that would give me destructive interference? Half of, half of the wavelength, right? That will give me the pi phase shift or half of cycle. So I want this to be half of the wavelength, all right? Um, oh, I guess I have everything. So based on this geometry here, this hypotenuse is half of the slit size. So the half of the, uh, that's hypotenuse, half of the slit size times the sine of the angle, sine theta one is equal to this. So, um, so then I get for 
diffraction minimum. Oh, that's what we call it for these uh, locations of destructive interference. We're going to be a little bit sloppy with the word diffraction and interference. <laughs> it's just going to be that way. Um, so for diffraction minimum, uh, it'll be A over 2 sine theta 1 is equal to uh, lambda over 2. A sine theta 1 is equal to lambda. All right. Um, so these two destructively interfere. Will these two destructively interfere also? Right? So you can say the same thing for every one of these as you move down across this uh, slit, um, which means, which means the, um, so you are adding up infinite number of zeros. So you get zero in the end. Now, uh, with the diffraction, the argument for the next order, so because when you see the diffraction pattern, you don't see just one, you see the next one, and then the next one, and then so on. So, um, so I need to find the more than one minimum. I need to find the whole series of minima. And when we are doing it for double solid interference, the way we did it was we considered the path length difference that was longer, right? If we had half of the wavelength, then you consider one and a half, two and a half, three and a half. With the diffraction, we are not going to do it that way. It comes down to, um, comes down to it's not a clean argument if you want to make it that way. Um, I, it's not, a, yeah, anyway. We're going to do it differently. <laughs> so, um, so we will actually keep this portion of the argument the same as we consider uh, next diffraction minimas that the path length difference will keep it at one half of the wavelength. What we are going to change is how we are breaking up this slit. So for the next diffraction minimum, uh, what we are going to do is, instead of imagining breaking up this slit into two halves, we are going to imagine breaking it up into quarters. So imagine having this broken up into quarters, then um, you can see that if, we are, if I'm trying to get the same length, this angle now has to be bigger. It has to be going at some angle like this. Um, I don't know if I'm doing it right. So drop down something perpendicular, and this will now be delta x. Right? And let me write down the relationships for the delta x using different color. So for this new, uh, delta x, uh, I guess it is the same delta x. So for that delta x, what I can say is that that's equal to the right-hand side. That would be the quarter of the slit size, a over 4 times the sine of, this is the second minimum. And the left-hand side, oh, it's going to be the same length, lambda over 2. So for this second minimum, what you see is, uh, so multiply through by 4, I get a sine theta 2 is equal to 2 lambda. So do you see the pattern for what the diffraction minimum? So this would be the destructive interference for, um, for single slit diffraction. Single slit diffraction should look like, like in general case, um, looks like everything stays the same. So this is the number that should change. Any suggestions? So n, integer n, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4. You can imagine continuing this argument forever. So for the general formula, we would say for diffraction minimum, it's n. And that n goes from um, 1, 2, 3. Now, did, could this n be 0? Yeah, n equals 0 gives you something um, different. Because when n equals equal to 0, that's when angle is 0. Well, you have a maximum there. You don't have minimum. So um, here, n only goes from 1, 2, 3. And if you're 1, you could say plus minus, but it's sort of uh, not super necessary. So, so this is the um, condition for destructive interference for single slit. Um, as you can see, once you get that little nifty mathematical trick about considering the entire slit, but breaking it to halves, and then pairing up the, uh, finding the pairs that will destructively interfere, then the rest of the reasoning is exactly the same as double slit interference. 
And for finding this minimum, it works out great. Um, now, while we have this expression up here, I want to bring your attention to this so that you, you, this won't confuse you in the future. So this is the expression for where you have destructive interference with a single slit diffraction. I want you to look at these expressions that we had for uh, double slit interference. Let me hide this. What, is this. what does this expression describe? Does this describe destructive interference or constructive interference? Yeah, constructive. Um, so, but you know, it looks exactly like that. It's very easy to get them confused. So please don't don't get them confused. <laughs> the argument leading to each of these formulas are exact. Well, they are different. That's why it's important for you to know the argument rather than trying to simply memorize the formulas because then eventually you'll get this confused with that, which are entirely different in almost every sense of the word. 